Jeff, have you seen the last piece of pumpkin pie? Mm. What did it look like? Come on, you're like 50 years old. You should know how pie looks. Jeff, 50? Oh, come on. Can you even count, count to 50? Uncle Jeff, I got some questions for you. Yes? Why do we have turkey on Thanksgiving? Because when cooked properly, every four or five years, it's delicious. Okay, so then why would we have green bean casserole then? <coughs> Touche. Why does it have a whip plate? But that's the pie. Uh, clearly it's not stopping you. Why did mom have a full plate of stuffing when she's on keto? Because carbs are comforting. Why can't I just lick my plate? If I'm in charge of the dishes, I actually encourage that. Why are there no unicorns in the Bible? Why am I not allowed to sit close to the TV? Why does water taste different in Nana's house? Why isn't Grandpa allowed to have salt? Why is gravy brown? Why am I not allowed to touch the air freshener? Why does Cooper pick his nose so much? Why does Mom call me by my sister's name? Why do we plant all the time? Huh? Why can't I eat grass? Why can't I sit in Dad's chair? Why is Sunday school called Sunday school? Why do cows have four stomachs? Huh? Why do parents whisper when they get mad? Huh? Why do old people write in person? Why do babies have no teeth? Why is baseball so boring? Why do fish have no lungs? Why is Thanksgiving before Christmas? I know why. You know why what? I know why Thanksgiving comes right before Christmas. <sighs> okay, tell me. Why does Thanksgiving come right before Christmas? Because it reminds us to be thankful that God sent us Jesus. <laughs> I never thought of that before. <laughs> I like that. All right, now. Hit me with some of that whipped cream, girl. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. He is good. Let's all stand together and open our Bibles to Psalm 116. The title of the message this morning is, I Will Live a Thankful Life. Did you know that thankful people are happier people? You know, we always find something to gripe about and complain about, can't we? I mean, we can always do that. Um, any simpleton can find something to gripe and complain about. What we as believers have been instructed to do by the Word of God is to give thanks and to search it out. And, and you don't have to look very long. There's a lot to be thankful for. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm thankful for you. You do that? I'm thankful for you. All right, in Psalm 116, keep your Bibles open to this uh, chapter. I love the Lord because He hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Let's pray. Father, this morning we do want to thank you that you hear our prayers. You're merciful, you're good, and you're kind, and you have blessed us beyond measure. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. There was a man that was sitting on a train, and directly across from him was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his life. So he sat there for a while and kept trying to get a glance and look her way. And finally he worked up his nerve. He said, ma'am, do you mind me asking you something? And she said, no, what, what, what would that be? And he said, are you married? And she said, uh, no, I'm not married. Well, uh, are you engaged? And she said, no, I'm not engaged. Well, are you uh, are you dating someone? And she said, no, I'm not dating anyone. He said, how in the world could that be? You're the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. And the woman looked at him and she said, well, I'm looking for certain qualities in a man. He said, and what would that be? And she said, well, I, I want someone who has the skin tone of an American Indian. I want someone who has the financial success of a Jewish man. And I want someone who has the earthiness of a southern boy. And then the man looked at her and said, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Geronimo Bernstein, but my friends call me Bubba. 
Uh, <laughs> just going to get them all this morning, right? Back in the 19th century, there was an incredible poet by the name of Elizabeth Barrett. What you may not know about her is that when she was 15 years old, she uh, acquired a spinal injury, and literally she had to lay in her bed all the time. But she had such beautiful poetry that sometimes people would come to her house and listen to her poetry. And sometimes if she were able to be taken somewhere, they would go to that place and listen to her poetry. But one of the people that came to her house one time was a man by the name of Robert Browning. Have you ever heard of him? Robert Browning. And he encouraged her and he inspired her and she fought for her life because of him. And then eventually they fell in love. And way back in 1846, they got married. She uh, wrote this poem for her husband. I know you've heard it. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth, breadth, and height my soul can reach. Isn't that beautiful? Today we're talking about love. Specifically, the love that David had for God, and even more than that, the love that God has for every one of us. Do you know that God loves you? It's an amazing thing that God loves us, but the Bible bears out over and over again that he does in fact love us. And, and David in, in Psalm 116 begins to count the ways that he loves the Lord. In fact, if you look at the uh, chapters 113 through 118, there are many portions of that that people to this very day will sing during the conclusion of the Lord's Supper. They sing those psalms. And that's a beautiful thing as well. So I want to share with you three things this morning very quickly, and, and maybe you'll get out on time, and if you do, you can be thankful for that, right? <laughs> Here's the first thing. Thank God, thank God, He loves us no matter what. I told you before, if I were God, I wouldn't put up with a single one of us. But think about the very first time you fell in love, all of the emotions that you had and the excitement and the joy that you had and the anticipation that you had to see that person. And you conclude in your heart, I can't live without you. Men, go ahead and look at your wife. You're sitting next to her right now and say, I can't live without you, baby. If you don't do it, you're going to have a lecture when you get home. So go ahead. You do that. I remember the first time I ever kissed Robin. I was uh, at her apartment. I was sitting in a chair, and she was sitting on the couch, and, and uh, we were having a conversation. And I had already made up my mind before I got there that night that I am going to kiss those big, plump, juicy pumpkin lips. <laughs> and so she's sitting on the end of the couch, and I got up from the chair, and I went over to the end of the couch, and I kind of got down on my knees. I'm looking her eye to eye, and I'm thinking, I'm about to move in for the kill. And I start moving toward her, and the anticipation grew, and it grew, and it grew. And finally, Robin couldn't take it anymore, so she grabbed and kissed me. <laughs> That's my version of what happened. <laughs> but things change after you've been married for a while. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, before you're married, you think, you take my breath away. After you're married for a while, it's like, did you brush your teeth? Before you're married, I love the way you take control of a situation. After you're married a while, you are a controlling egomaniac. <laughs> men, if you agree with this, I want a big amen from you. Before you're married, Saturday night fever. After you're married, Monday night football. <laughs> amen. Before you're married, it's like I'm in a dream. After you're married a while, it's like I'm in a nightmare. Before you're married, when I look in your eyes, time stands still. After you're married, you've got a face that would stop a clock. <laughs> Don't ever use that one, men. But what about God's love for us? Well, one thing we know about God's love for us, it's holy. God's love for us is holy. Now, contrast that, your own love, to God's love. You see, ours is consequent, but God's is causeless. You know why God loves you? He just loves you, you know. 
Uh, our love is conditional, but God's love is unconditional. You say, well, our love is conditional. If you behave a certain way, you act a certain way, you do things you're supposed to do, not do things you're not supposed to do, then I love you. But God says, I love you no matter what you do. His love for us is unconditional. Our love is emotional, but God's love is eternal. Our love sometimes for God is in question, but God's love for us is never in question. Amen? He loves us beyond measure. He loves us because love is what He is. John 14 or 4, 8 says, God is love. Can we say that together? God is how many of you remember one of the songs you learned when you were a child, Jesus Loves Me? Remember that song? Help me out, church. Jesus Come on. Amen. Sing the chorus. Yes. Yes, Jesus loves me. Amen. Give yourself a round of applause. That was beautiful. Now, Jesus doesn't love us because of who we are. He loves us because of who He is. His love for us is is holy. But something else, God's love for us is trustworthy. You see, God loves us, and He's constantly demonstrating His love toward us, and He's constantly sharing His love for us. During the Spanish Inquisition, Napoleon's soldiers found a, a dungeon, and they go inside this dungeon, and deep inside the dungeon there was the remains, there was still a skeleton there of a man who had been chained to a, a wall. And the man had somehow carved uh, on, on the stone where he was at a shape of a rugged cross there. And at the top of that cross, this man wrote the word height. And at the bottom of the cross, he wrote the word depth. And on one side of the cross, he wrote the word breath. And on the other side of the cross, he wrote the, wrote the word length. He was showing us the depth of God's love for us. He loves us really in a much deeper way than we can begin to comprehend or understand. You see, we're prisoners of God's love. I don't mind being a prisoner of God's love to you. He has blessed us. How much does God love you? Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, but God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were yet sinners. Now that's great love. You know, if I were God, I'd let everyone go to hell. I would, except my, myself, of course. You know, but yeah, I mean, if I were God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give my own son to die for somebody else's sins. I could not do that. But that's because I don't understand that depth of love. But God says, I love you so much, I'm going to send my son to die for you. There was a little girl who wrote a letter to God. And the letter said, Dear God, I bet it's hard for you to love everyone in the whole wide world. There are just four people in my family, and I can't stand my little brother. <laughs> God loves us in spite of us. He loves us. He loves everyone. The skeptic, the atheist, the scoffer, the saint, the Muslim, the Buddhist, the Hindu, the homeless, the helpless, and the hopeless. God loves every one of us. You see, His love is unsurpassed. It's unparalleled. It's unprecedented, invincible, incomprehensible, and irreplaceable. Amen. Amen. That's God's love. Let's thank the Lord. So God loves us in spite of ourselves. He loves us no matter what. But secondly, I will proclaim my love for God. I will proclaim my love for God. Because God loved the psalmist, the psalmist turns around and says, I am not ashamed to proclaim my love for God. You see, every one of us, our neighbors, our friends, our family members, our co-workers, our classmates, every single one of us, and the people surrounding our life should know that we love God because we are not ashamed to tell people, I love the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now, what about this? Well, God showered David with all kinds of blessings, didn't He? 
It says again in verse 1, I love the Lord because. Now, let's pause for a moment. He's about to tell us just a few things as to reasons why he loves the Lord. And they're not comprehensible at all. He's saying that I love the Lord because. These are not exhaustive, but I want to share with you, David is saying, a few things as to why I love the Lord. And he says, first of all, I love the Lord because he hears our prayers. He hears our prayers. In verse 1 again, I love the Lord because He hears my voice and my prayer for mercy, because He bends down to listen. I will pray as long as I have breath. Death wrapped its ropes around me. The terrors of the grave overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. Now, that word right there, where, where the phrase where it says He bends down to listen, one version interprets that as the word inclined. Now get the picture. It's like you start praying and God bends down on the precipice of heaven. He bends down, he sees you, and he cocks his head and he inclines his ear toward you. He wants to hear every single word that you are saying, much like a husband does when his wife's got something to say. <laughs> that is, of course, a joke, right? Right? But God listens. He's hanging on to every word. When we pray, listen, the next time you pray, you need to picture God that way in your mind's eye. God is, is standing there and he cocked his head and he's inclining his ear toward me. What I've got to say means something to God. So when you pray, remember that he's listening to every single word. And then something else about this, he helps us in our need. Have you ever needed something? Have you ever needed someone? Look at verse 3. Death wrapped its ropes around me. The terrors of the grave overtook me. I saw only trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Please, Lord, save me. Have you ever been there? Lord, I need you to save me. If you don't reach down from heaven and save me, I am surely lost. I need your help. I need your help, Lord. And you're the only one. Who can come through? Now, men really wrestle with this because men, we're fixers, you know. We're like, if, if our wives come to us and, say, and tell us a problem they've got, they're upset about something, what do we do? Well, let me tell you how to fix that A, B, C, and one, two, three. And they don't want us to tell them how to fix it because women are weird. <laughs> they just want us to listen. But that's not the way us men function. We're fixers, you know. But there are times in my own life, and I'm sure your life as well, men, that God has put you in a place where you can't fix it. Either he's going to get it done or it's not going to happen. Sometimes he just takes all that control out of our hands. We're not real comfortable with that. And, and the, that's where David was. Lord, I need you to save me because I can't fix this. He says, trouble and sorrow are hunting me down and finding me. I'm not even looking for it. I'm not looking for trouble. I'm not looking for sorrow. And yet they come hunting me down. You see, all the pain of hell had overwhelmed him. And so David cries out in verse 6, The Lord protects those of childlike faith. I was facing death, and he saved me. It's interesting how often we see the reference to childlike faith in the Word of God. The inference to childlike faith. God just wants us to believe in Him. Sometimes in life we get disabled in our strength. We get depressed in our body, disillusioned in our character, discouraged in the spirit. That's where we are. But the Lord reached down and He helped out David. If God will help David, will He help you? Church, come on now. Will He help you? You think about the Apostle Paul. Paul had been stoned, and not this kind of stone. <laughs> this kind of stone. He had been stoned, he had been imprisoned. The Bible records for us that he was under house arrest for two years, shipwrecked, beaten, persecuted, bitten by a snake. I would have thrown the towel in right there. I don't like snakes. He had been bitten by a snake, lied on, abandoned, and forsaken. And what did Paul say amidst all of those troubles that he had? You know what he said? He looked around all of the shambles, all the trouble, all the pain he had experienced. And Paul said, and yet the Lord stood with me. Remember that. When you're having trouble, the Lord is standing with you. 
He's never going to leave you. He will never forsake you. He, he will never abandon you. And yet the Lord stood with me. Some of you can say, and I wish I'd written this. I didn't write it, but I want to read it to you. Uh, someone said this, I've been lied on, cheated on, talked about, mistreated, rebuked, scorned, talked about as sure as you're born. I've been up, I've been down almost to the ground. But as long as I've got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. I know he's a burden bearer. I know he's a heavy load sharer. He'll be a bridge over troubled water. He'll be a doctor and a lawyer. He'll be a friend when you're friendless. He'll be a mother when you're motherless. He'll be your bread when you're hungry. He'll be your comfort when you're lonely. But as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. Amen. Amen. No wonder David loved the Lord. But something else about this passage, God gives stability in unstable situations. In verse 7, let my soul be at rest again, for the Lord has been good to me. Do you agree that the Lord, Lord's been good to you? Yes. I'm not sure you are. Has the Lord been good to you? Yes. Better than you deserve? This is what David said. Let my soul be at rest again, for the Lord has been good to me. He has saved me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. God heard him and God helped him. And the Bible bears out that he raised him and he took him to heights he had never been to before. And he blessed him beyond anything he could possibly imagine. That's what God did for him. Someone wrote a beautiful poem called Blessed. Listen to this. If you owe just one Bible, you are abundantly blessed. One third of the world does not have access to even one. If you woke up this morning with more health and illness, you are more blessed than a million people who will die this week. If you have never experienced the danger of battle, the loneliness of imprisonment, the agony, torture, or the pangs of starvation, you are ahead of 500 million people around the world. If you attend a church meeting without the fear of harassment, arrest, or fear of death, you are more blessed than almost 3 billion people in our world. If you have food in your refrigerator, you are richer than 75% of the people in this world. If you have money in the bank or spare change in a dish, you are a top, among the top 8% of the world's wealthiest people. If you can hear or read this message, you are more blessed than over 2 billion people in all of the world that cannot hear or read anything about the gospel at all. Would you agree that you're blessed? How many of you like me, you got more than one refrigerator in your house? Would you raise your hand? How many of you got a refrigerator and a deep freeze? Would you raise your hand? How many of you got food in that refrigerator or deep freeze? Would you raise your hand? We're blessed. Oh, count your blessings. Help me out, church. Name them by one. We've got every reason to be thankful. If you've got shoes on your feet and clothes on your back and a home to live in and food to eat, let me ask you this. Is there any reason we shouldn't love God? None. He's given us more than we deserve. He's blessed us beyond measure. But there's a third thing, the last thing I want to share with you. I'm thankful enough to prove my love for God. So David bears out that God loves us beyond measure. And so he's now talking about how can we respond to that love? He asked the question, what can I offer the Lord for all he has done for me? And now he says, I'm going to prove I love the Lord. God's love for us is always honest, isn't it? In verse 10, I believed in you. So I said, I am deeply troubled, Lord. Verse 11, in my anxiety, I cried out to you. These people are all liars. The psalmist had been deeply hurt probably beyond anything most can imagine. He said, he, he was saying, I feel like my heart has been ripped out of my chest. Men are lying about me. Have you ever been lied on by someone you thought you could trust? Someone that you believed in, someone that maybe you've even helped in life, and then you find out they've been lying about you. Men were lying about the psalmist. And then what did God do? He transformed the psalmist. He said to the psalmist, 
I want you to love me more than you've ever loved me. And then he goes on to teach him, and I want you to love your fellow man more than you've ever loved your fellow man. Well, when we truly love God, we're going to love as He loves. We're going to love what He loves. We're going to love who He loves. We're going to love how He loves. We'll do all of those things. Now, I'll be the first to admit, it's hard to love some people. Amen? Some people, it takes a double dose of the Holy Spirit to love. And yet, that's what God commands that we do. And if we could just learn to love people, we'd be happier. I know we get angry at people, especially those whose ideologies are far different than our own, and we get upset with them, we get angry at them, and if we're not careful, that anger will turn into hatred. God says, love your fellow man. Just because you love someone does not mean that you're putting your stamp of approval on it. You you say, well, what in the world do you mean by that, preacher? There are a lot of people that I love that uh, are in horrible sin. Wicked sin. Sin the Bible specifically says not to be a part of, but I still love them. That does not mean I approve of what they do. And I'm thankful that there are people who love me in spite of myself. That's a blessing to me. Well, God transformed the psalmist. He says, love me and love your fellow man. And then there's something else. God's love for us is selfless. Selfless in verse 16. Oh, Lord... I am your servant. Yes, I am your servant. Born into your household, you have freed me from my chains. You see, prior to this, life had been all about David. Now, he said, I've got a new life, and my new life is going to be all about God. Now, it's hard sometimes to set yourself aside, especially when you've been wronged or or when you've been lied about or when you've been cheated on. It's hard to set ourselves aside But yet the Bible instructs us that that's what we must do. The Bible says we must love. In 1 John it says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. And he that does not know God, does not love, does not know God. For God is love. What's the last part of that? For God is? He's love. Look at the person next to you and say, I love you. Even if you don't know him, say, I love you. It's an opportunity for single people right now. (laughs) You say, I'd like to love you. How about that? See, God's love for us is costly. So after examining all that God had done for him, the blessings and the fact that God inclines his ear toward him, hears his prayers, and helped him out of trouble, David asked this question. It's a great question. Every one of us should ask in verse 12, what can I offer the Lord for all that he has done for me? And then he begins to name some things I'm going to offer the Lord. Verse 9 he says, and so I will walk in the Lord's presence as I live here on earth. He'll offer that to the Lord. Verse 13, I will lift up the cup of salvation and praise the Lord's name for saving me. Verse 14, I will keep my promises to the Lord in the presence of all His people. Verse 17, I will offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Verse 18, I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people. God has done so much for us. We should all ask the question, what can we do for you, Lord, for you are good. Amen. God's been good to me. Has He been good to you? All right, y'all ready to preach a little bit? All right, here we go. Not a long dissertation. Just get up. Somebody raise their hand and name one thing they're thankful for this morning. Just one. Yes, ma'am. Your grandchildren. Amen. Amen. We baptized my oldest grandchild this morning. Amen. Holly Bell. I'm telling you, it's not a feeling like in the world. It's one thing to see your kids baptized. You're excited and thankful for that. But to see that next generation baptized as well, what a blessing. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. The Lord let you be able to, to walk and dance again. You're in a Baptist church. You do realize that, don't you? <laughs> You know why Baptists don't dance? Because we are terrible. That's why. (laughs) Man, I'm thanking the Lord for that. What a praise. What a praise of the Lord. David danced before the Lord. Amen. Yes, sir. 
Say that again. Roof over your head and food. Praise the Lord for that. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you so much. Thankful for me and the staff of this church. There's going to be an extra star in your crown. I guarantee you that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. She, she hasn't drank for 13, 12, 13 years? Amen. And she drank for 40 years, and God rescued her from that. Amen. What a praise. What a praise. Yes, sir. I thank God for my salvation. Amen. Amen. He sent you a beautiful wife. He did indeed. Yes, sir. There you go. We can have an argument over that, right? That's awesome. Best wife in the world. Yes, sir. Your granddaughter. Amen. What a blessing. Yes, sir. Amen. Thank you, Monty. God bless you. Yes, ma'am. You're going to be a grandma again? Well, congratulations. Isn't God good? He's good. Yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord. Thank you for my life group. Thank you for my class. Amen. That's fantastic. How about one more? Anybody else? Uh, we'll do two more. Right back here. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. People that don't think God's still in the healing business are missing out because God still heals. Amen? He does. Yes, sir. Amen. Thank you, Trent. God bless you, brother. I'm glad I came to church today. Are you? See, we all feel better. Why? Because we're thinking about things we're thankful for. Don't let this old world beat you down where you can't even see the blessings of God. We've got a lot to praise the Lord for. Let's all stand together. 